if you're planning to fill a gap in your border or even maybe redesigning the whole border, you may be, like me, thinking about looking for drought tolerant plants. Here in Kent, in South East England, we had the hottest, driest summer practically on record and many of our gardens were really fried and we've got gaps. It's Alexandra here from the Middle South Garden YouTube channel and blog and I've come to Jane Beadle's garden because it didn't fry and it didn't get gaps. But of course, even if we are predicted to have hotter, drier summers in the future, we may well get odd wet summers. So we don't want to get lots of drought tolerant plants that then sit there and look miserable if we have a sudden wet summer. For example, last summer we had twice the normal rainfall. And Jane's garden looked fantastic during that summer too. So I've come to talk to Jane, who's a former garden designer. She's a great British Bake Off finalist, and she also does cookery tips on her Instagram feed, Jane B Bakes. Uh, but above all, to find out what exactly she's planted in her garden that can look so good in this hot, dry weather, and yet survive also a summer that maybe has double the amount of rainfall. I'll put links to any resources we mention in the description below. And if you're new here, the Middle Size Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. To give you an idea of what the weather is like here in Kent, South East England, we roughly equate to a USDA hardiness zone of nine because our winters are very mild. It would be rare for us to go below minus six Celsius, 21 Fahrenheit, and most of the time in the winter we're not even freezing. But of course our summers are not usually as hot as a zone nine. This summer we went up to 40 Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit, and it has been consistently very dry. We had a whole month with virtually no rain at all. So just to start with the planting debate that's going on in the gardening world at the moment is that what we all know is that in their first couple of years trees and shrubs and perennials are not as drought tolerant as they are once they've really got their roots down and settled into the soil. So there is some debate about how long you should water plants for after they've planted because the don't water them brigade say soak the roots thoroughly before you plant them Soak the planting hole with full of water, let it drain away, and then give the plant a really good soaking once it's planted. But then after that, no more water because it'll come to rely on it. Whereas the other side say you do need to water trees, shrubs and perennials in their first year to give them a chance to get their roots down. So what's your view on that? Well, I would say if you don't want to chuck your money straight down the toilet, then you need to water them. Um, and if you go for a larger shrub, so say something in a 10 litre pot or a tree that you buy by girth size, so generally that's a much larger root ball, if you don't water them, they're just going to die. I, I don't care how much you water that hole and water that root ball before you plant it, they will die. And what you want to do is you want to encourage those roots to go down into the soil and the trick is to water them perhaps once a week really well so the soil gets very wet underneath the root ball and then the roots will go down. The fatal thing for new planting is to just water on the surface a little bit, you know, stand there and water for five minutes. If you dig down you'll find that the top, perhaps a quarter of an inch, half an inch tops is actually wet, in which case the roots want to come up to the surface to get the water. And of course, if the roots are on the surface, they're going to be more prone to drying out. So a good soaking once a week until that tree's or large shrub is established. So obviously, as a garden designer, I think you'd advise people to put their trees in first and then design the rest of the garden around that, wouldn't you? So what would you say are the best good drought resistant trees here in this garden? So I have a wonderful silver birch in the garden and I bought it at quite a large size because I wanted instant, instant effect if you like. It took four men to carry it in um, and I watered it a lot for the first two years and the second year it did look a little tired at times and I needed to chuck big buckets of water on it. But this year with having got its roots well down into the soil, I have not watered it at all and it's looking magnificent. Other trees that are really good in drought, of course, are the olives. And I have a couple of olives here in pots, but that's because I wanted the height and I like, like them in pots. The problem with, with olives in a wet, claggy clay soil is if you haven't incorporated lots of organic matter, if you have a particularly wet winter, those roots could sit in a, a soggy soil, which wouldn't be great. So improve the soil, maybe put some drainage in, and your olives will certainly cope with 
any heat you want to chuck at it. And I think you've also got an amelanchia here that has done very well in this hot, dry summer, but will be fine if, it, if we have a wet one. Yes, the amelanchia really surprised me because it can be prone to mildew when it gets dry. I mean, they survive, but they look fairly manky. But this year, again, it's been in as, as long as my birch has and was watered very well for the first couple of years. And I keep it trimmed to a large shrub. And the wonderful thing about amelanchia is they cope with clay, they cope with wet, they cope with pollution, and they give you blossom in the spring. And I love their fresh foliage. Lovely. And now let's look at the shrubs and perennials. You've got a very good colour balance here because actually most of the drama is actually coming from foliage contrast. And then you've got these bright pops of colour. And I think that's what makes a huge impact. What would you say are the three best shrubs in this garden? I think shrubs are incredibly important in a garden, be the garden large or small, because they give you structure throughout the year and you very much appreciate them in the winter. So I have quite a lot of evergreen shrubs. Um, I love Pittosporum. Pittosporum are marvellous and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes really. So I'll use Pittosporum golf ball instead of box balls because they're much more sort of disease and bug resistant. Um, another one I love is Nandina which gives you berries in the winter. It can give you different color foliage. There's lemon and lime, which I have, which is a bright yellowy green, you know, um, foliage. I have, now I never know whether it's obsessed or obsession, but I have Nandina obsession that has red leaves in the spring and goes through looking gorgeous all year. And then panicles of white flowers and red berries that will persist through to spring. So that's marvellous. So any of the Nandinas are incredibly drought tolerant. I also see you've got sage. Now I think most of us don't even think of sage as a, as a shrub, but I gather the RHS as it is a shrub. And of course it gives you a lovely sort of grey green colour throughout the year. And that's of course fantastic in drought and it doesn't worry at all about um, the odd wet summer either does it? No in fact my sage has been incredible I, I don't use a huge amount of it in cooking but I love this silvery mound I do keep it very well pruned back so it doesn't get too leggy um, but it keeps this lovely sort of rounded shape and beautiful leaves that haven't suffered at all. And of course you can get the purple leaf sage, which looks so pretty in a border, you almost think it's an ornamental and not a culinary plant. So yes, sage is fantastic, I love it. And speaking of sage, of course, there are two members of the sage family which are doing some wonderful flowers for you as well, aren't they? Which is the Perovskia blue spire, which is now apparently called Salvia blue spire, and indeed the salvias, and you've got Salvia gregii, I think. So just talk me through the flower colour that's done so well in this hot summer, but also did well last year in the wet. Gregii, I absolutely love. Uh, it gives you that pop of red, and for all those people who like the pastels and the pinks and the this and the that, you need a little bit of pop as contrast. And the Greggia catches me out every year because I prune it back um, in sort of late late spring. Don't put, don't prune them back too early because otherwise they could get damaged by the, the frost. But I prune it back in late spring and, and it goes back into this tiny sort of little space. And then I frantically plant around it, forgetting completely that it grows into this massive bush. Um, you would think I would learn, wouldn't you? But it just keeps flowering from the moment it gets going, which is June, end of May, June, it gets going and it flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers right the way through until the autumn and first frosts really. So it's a fantastic doer, the Greggii. And there are plenty of salvias in that same part of the family that will give you the most glorious pops of colour if you would prefer an orangey one or a purpley one. And of course the bees love it. And in the dry conditions we're also looking for lots of things that will keep our insects happy. Yes that is an important point because I mm. think a pollinators had a really tough time mm. this last summer. Other plants I can see here Verbena bonariensis. In my garden Verbena bonariensis has been absolutely fine in rain, sun, drought. It's been completely untroubled by this last summer we've just had. And I've also noticed you've got a climber here, star jasmine or Trachylospermum jasminoides, and that's been a good one for you in the drought, hasn't it? Oh, yes, as climbers go, I, it's fantastic. Um, it seems to have survived. Again, I haven't watered it 
dipped this year at all. In fact, water dipped very little since it's been in. It can be slow to get going, but now it's roaring up the fences. And of course it has jasmine-like flowers, which again is great for pollinators, lovely for us, and it's evergreen, so it's there as a good structural plant all through the winter. And actually I have it on the sunny side of my garden, which gets full sun virtually all day. And I've also got it on the shady side of my garden, which you wouldn't think it would thrive in at all. And it, it seems to be scampering up the, the wall and the fence is perfectly right. So I would always say, go for one of those. Instead of maybe a clematis, I know I love clematis, but the clematis are all looking a bit mm, sad now, where I'm expecting some of them to still be flowering. But the, the jasmine is still throwing out the odd flower, even though it's late in the season. So yeah, a great climber, I think. And then of course there's wonderful drought resistant plants for pots. Now of course pots you will always have to water because uh, they only get their water from you really. Rain mm. doesn't get into pots. Um, but on the other hand having drought resistant plants in there is quite a help because if you've got really hot dry temperatures the plant pots will dry out even faster. And I think you've got a complete classic here which is pelagonium. And you've also got a bulb I haven't seen anywhere which is what Tulbagia violacea? Talbagia violacea, I believe, so please don't, don't <laughs> quote me on that. But it's a marvellous little plant. I think it's in the garlic family. And it just flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers. A little bit later in the summer, probably end of June, beginning of July. But unlike most agapanthus, and it has almost, it almost looks like a mini agapanthus. Unlike that, it just carries on throwing out new flower spikes. And although I have got it in a pot, I've also got it in the ground. And where I've got it in the ground, I haven't watered it at all. And these wonderful little violety, pale violet, lilac-y flowers pop out and just shine in amongst the strap-like foliage. So I absolutely love it. And actually, people came around the other day and saw it in the garden. And I think everybody was completely captivated by it. I think it's Mediterranean. Um, and so just in the fact that it is from the Mediterranean means it will grow in a dry condition. But again, it's survived all the wet summer of last year. What other flowers have really done well in the summer? Um, echinacea, and I just have this common garden, Echinacea purpurea, which has been amazing. And the bees are, st are still really enjoying it and they seem to have done incredibly well. Now, I know this has changed its name and I haven't got a clue what the new name is, but I have sedum. I think it's Autumn Joy, I can't exactly remember which one. It and the sedums, of course, will survive almost anything and they do very well in drought conditions as well. So they are two really good doers. Phlox, you need to water like mad because it'll go mildewy. So if you're looking for a drought tolerant, don't look at phlox. Another wonderful little plant that seems to grow in incredibly well ar around here is Erigeron carvinskianus, which just will settle in any crevice and, and just grow away. I first saw it at um, Great Dixter, I think, many moons ago. And of course, what would a border be without some good grasses? And I think the one here that you've got is Anaman, oh dear, we're going to have to struggle with this, aren't we? <laughs> Anamanthele lessoniana, and it's all known as pheasant tail grass. But that's done really well in both your hot, dry summer and last year's wet summer, hasn't it? Yes, it's a brilliant one. It used to be called Stiper arundinaceae until they changed it to something that we couldn't pronounce. Yes, I'm, doing, I'm not even going to go there. Probably, I think they just try and trip us up, don't they, with these wonderful words. But it's it is fantastic, and it grows into this really fountain of grass um, with wonderful seed heads. It does self-seed a little bit, but not, not too badly. But because my garden is small, I like to sort of knock it back into shape. Now, most of the advice is you, you just rake out the dead grass and uh, dead bits and, and leave the, the shape there. But frankly, don't tell the experts, but I cut mine down every year and it comes back into a very manageable shape. But I have it on the shady side of my garden and I have it on the sunny side of my garden. It copes in drought and it copes in, in wet conditions. So again, lovely. And you have this slightly 
um, ready pinky tinge to it as it gets older, which also just gives you a little bit more glowing interest in the garden. I have to admit that all my dahlias except one completely fried. And the dahlia that I've got that did very well is the same one that's just behind you now, which is Dahlia Stephen Ryan. And of course, one would love to recommend this to people as a you know really good drought resistant dahlia, but unfortunately, it's only available at Stephen Ryan's own nursery, which is called Dixonia Rare Plants and is in Mount Macedon just outside Melbourne, Australia, which may not be convenient for many people <laughs> trying to get this dahlia, but that is, that's done really well, hasn't it? It's done pretty well, and I have to say, I didn't get mine from Melbourne, Australia. I got it from you, which, <laughs> for which I'm incredibly grateful. Um, it, it has done very well, it just keeps on flowering, really, and when it was particularly dry, um, the, the flowers seemed to be much smaller but it, we've had a couple of downpours over the last couple of weeks and it perked up no end and you can see that it's flowering away like mad. The problem with dahlias is they, they do need a, an awful lot of care and water, I think. But I think we were talking about this the other day. I have this theory. So they tell you to mulch your garden, either with gravel or, or a good mulch of, of organic matter, which was, will always improve your soil anyway, to stop the soil underneath drying out. Well, my garden, as you can probably see, is completely packed with plants. You can barely see a little bit of soil. And I think that's why the dahlias have survived, because the leaf coverage from all my evergreens and other things stops the wind and the sun going directly onto the soil and maybe that has acted as you know a green mulch if you like and stop them drying out quite as much as they might if you've got a plant soil a plant soil then the sun is going to get at that soil and dry it out even faster so i would always say if you don't want to weed and you don't want to water too much pack your garden with as many plants as you can let me know if you've got any good recommendations for drought tolerant plants that won't mind some rain. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.